Apple's plans for its future Mac processors suggest those new chips are likely to easily outperform Intel's future processors for consumer PCs. I'm Renee Ritchie, thanks to Curiosity Stream with Nebula for sponsoring, and yeah, we gotta talk about this. And then the M1 Max MacBook Pro did it in four minutes and six seconds. I turned on the 16 inches high power mode, three minutes and 49 seconds. Jesus. Okay, now imagine that, but with double or quadruple the cores, media engines, and unified memory. Yeah. Oh, damn! Quad o dams. But more on that Mac Pro and maybe iMac Pro in an Alder Lake sizzling hot minute. First, there's been just a lot of chatter over the last couple of days about Intel's new 12th gen processors and what exactly they mean for Apple and for the Mac. Alder Lake is basically just a play by Intel to buy some time by goosing a whole lot of voltage as high as possible to win some cred over AMD from the benchmark LARPers, all while they get their new big little architecture and process shrink silicon chips back in order, which I personally really, really hope they do because getting Intel back in the game is just better for everyone. But Alder Lake cores score big because they draw big. And some might say that only really matters for laptops like the new MacBook Pro, where you want more than a few minutes of battery life. But no, really not. It matters for desktops too, because power doesn't just define battery life, but thermal throttling, and yes, even enclosure design. I could not find a air cooler that could fit and properly cool this motherboard. Even the few that did fit just didn't have the capacity to pull enough heat off of this chip. So I was forced to use water cooling. I mean, can you even imagine the what if episode where Apple didn't make the switch to custom silicon and Uatu is now watching them try to cram one of these Shuma Gorath level monsters into the next Mac mini or iMac, watching it melt its way through the casing and burn all the way to the center of the earth like a homesick Gojira? because we're talking under 30 watts for the M1 Pro or Mac CPU fully lit, under 100 watts, including the Mac's 32 GPU cores, if you somehow fire everything! Like the J.J. Abrams Star Trek movie. While with Alder Lake, just the CPUs burn at well over 100 watts and climb from there to well over 200 watts, 300 watts even for the overclocked version. That's as much as one of those big Nvidia or AMD cards, the ones that look like massive guild highliners folding into space above Arrakis. And yes, I am totally mixing up my sci-fi universes here because of just how ridiculous it all is. When Tim Cook said, when we look ahead, we envision some amazing new products and transitioning to our own custom silicon is what will enable us to bring them to life. This is exactly what he was talking about. And it's just what might let them make an M1 Pro and Max Mac mini that won't need to be water cooled. An M1 Pro and Max iMax that take up no more room than a Pro display XDR. Or yes, a new Mac Pro that absent massive Intel chips and AMD boards doesn't have to be anywhere nearly as massive itself. And instead of spending upwards of 300, 400, 600 watts or more on that, they can spend them on scaling M1 Max to the extreme. Because little Shyamalan style plot twist, everyone realizes by now that Apple was well into working on M1 when the 2019 Mac Pro was announced. Right? So why did they divert all those resources to that Intel box and the 2019 16-inch MacBook Pro? Well, let me know in the comments if you wanna see a dedicated video on how I think all of that drama played out. But things like the Afterburner ProRes card were designed by the Silicon team to give the 2019 Mac Pro an Intel usable way to gain some of the benefits of what the media engines were gonna be able to deliver built in for the M1 MacBook Pro and yeah, Mac Pro, only with far, far more extreme performance, the kind that comes from being on die and fed by all that bandwidth and unified memory. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman has been covering it for a long while now, most recently in a tweet that says, for those who think the M1 Pro and M1 Max in the MacBook Pro are impressive, the new Mac desktop is expected to come in at least two variations, 2X and 4X the number of CPU and GPU cores as the M1 Max. That's up to 40 CPU cores and 128 GPU cores at the high end. And here's what the information's Wayne Ma just added. The next Mac Pro, which targets professional users, will include a processor with at least two dies based on the M1 Max as part of a family of first-generation processors codenamed Jade. 
We're designing a family of SOCs specifically for the Mac product line. Wayne also dropped a ton of really juicy details about M2 and M3, which I'll cover in the very next video. So make sure that subscribe button and bell and look for a link below as soon as it goes live. Basically, Jade is the M1 or what's inside the ultra low power Macs, including the MacBook Air, two port MacBook Pro, silver Mac mini and 24 inch rainbow iMacs. Jade C Chop is the M1 Pro and Jade C Die is the M1 Max. And that's what's inside the higher performance multi-port MacBook Pros that Apple just shipped. So next, according to Mark, is Jade 2C die and Jade 4C die for the Mac Pro. And what that sounds like is rather than a single new monolithic die or just another even bigger version of M1, like an M1 Extreme, Apple's gonna go with dual or quad M1 Max dies all on the same package, whether Apple calls it something like M1 Extreme or sticks with something way more conventional like dual or quad M1 Max, we'll have to wait and see. But that's all purely a marketing decision. The silicon itself is way more interesting because what it means is four iStorm efficiency cores, 16 Firestorm performance cores, 64 G13 graphics cores, 64 gigabytes of unified memory, quad H.264 and 65 encode blocks, and quad ProRes encode and decode blocks at the entry level. The entry level, but on the high end, eight E cores and 32 P cores for a massive 40 core CPU, 128 GPU cores, 256 gigabytes of unified memory, eight H.264 and 265 encode blocks, eight ProRes encode and decode blocks, and a partridge in a flippin' pear tree. And that's if, enormous if, Apple hasn't also figured out some brilliant or even hella ugly way to add off package memory options into the unified system and some form of the current Intel Mac Pro's expansion module system for even more compute options, either right away or at some future point with the M2 or M3 architectures. So while yes, sure, it's possible the 2019 Mac Pro was just a one-off and Apple sucked up all that R&D in penance or something for the 2013 trash can, but Afterburner turned out to be not so much, so we'll see. And yeah, there are a whole bunch of questions about how Apple will even tie all these dies together on package to really get all the performance possible out of them, but it looks like that's in part exactly how they were engineered to begin with. So just fabric all the things. But either way, anyway, that'd be 2x the performance of the new top of the line MacBook Pro for the dual version, 4x for the quad version, because math, and with all the unified memory to feed the CPU and 400 gigabits per second bandwidth to feed the GPU, but both also benefiting both. And that's just nothing we've ever seen, not even from a pro workstation before. And at a performance per watt ratio that just ratios Alder Lake, which may be nice for a slightly smaller Mac Pro, but if Apple's considering even putting the dual version of the Macs into something like an iMac or iMac Pro, that's just something that absolutely just wouldn't otherwise be even possible. And the really cool thing, the really, really cool thing is that Apple's already told us exactly how they're gonna do all this. I'm talking to the VP of Custom Silicon himself, and you can listen to the extended version of my interview with him and the VP of Mac Product Marketing ad-free and sponsor-free on Nebula. That's where I post all of my videos, including extended versions of my interviews, reviews, and explainers, and my exclusive documentary on the original iPhone. There was no question that was a game-changer phone. That was ahead of its time. We're gonna make some history together today. The iPhone really, I mean, it has changed, I mean, my life in so many ways. All on Nebula, where I have the luxury of making videos that don't have to be optimized for YouTube, but where I just know the nerdiest, most hardcore of you will absolutely love them. All ad-free, sponsor-free on Nebula and bundled in for free when you sign up with today's sponsor, curiositystream.com slash Renee Ritchie, or click the link below. And right now, because you're watching this video, you can get Curiosity Stream for 26% off, less than 15 bucks a year, less than the price of a USB-C dongle for the whole entire year. And that includes their thousands of amazing documentaries and series like Science of Thrills, where engineer and adventurer Rob Bell climbs aboard some of the world's fastest theme park rides and discovers, well, just what exactly they're doing to our bodies. It is the absolute best way to support educational creators directly and the best damn deal in streaming today. For over 26% off Curiosity Stream, less than 15 bucks a year, and Nebula bundled in for free. Just click the button on the screen or go to curiositystream.com slash Renee Ritchie. Clicking on that button really helps out the channel and so does hitting the playlist above for more. Just much more on M1, M1 Pro, M1 Max, and whatever's coming next. Just hit that playlist and I'll see you in the next video.